instead of the usual uh, uh, motiv uh, overview and uh, the motivational part, uh, I'll, uh, in the beginning of the talk, I'll parse its title. So the first part of the title, Deterministic Public Encryption, uh, appears to be flying in the face of uh, 30 years of modern cryptography, whose early insight was that um, randomization is essential for uh, security of encryption. But in recent years, there was efforts to, uh, to, to understand deterministic public encryption, uh, to give its meaningful security definition, and understand when it makes sense, uh, and it actually provides some security guarantees. Uh, so in the spirit of semantic security, uh, to uh, define determ de deterministic uh, encryption, we'll give an adversary to choose, uh, instead of the uh, two messages, the adversary will choose two sources of messages. Because it's easy to see if, that if the messages are fully controlled by the adversary, there is not much we can do if we insist on the encryption scheme be being deterministic. So the adversary gets to choose two sources, and uh, we want some unpredictability in the kind of uh, entropy that we like is mean entropy that bounds the, the maximal probability of an output. We'll say that a deterministic, encry deterministic encryption scheme is secure uh, if the uh, distribution distributions induced on these two sources by encrypting them are computationally indistinguishable. And this definition was given by uh, Bellar and others in crypto 2007. Um, the important note is that these two sources must be independent of the public key. For example, the public key can be sampled after the sources are, are, identified, by, are identified by the adversary. Uh, so there are, sort of, there are some applications uh, of a secure de deterministic encryption. Uh, it can be used uh, for search, for the application. There are deterministic uh, key, uh, key encapsulation mechanisms. Uh, in order for deterministic encryption to be secure, it relies on certain computational assumptions that we are mostly comfortable with, but it also makes this very strong assumption of the mean entropy of the plain text. And there are some circumstances where this assumption can be justified when we are talking about, we are, we are talking about signature, uh, sorry, digital photographs, or long documents, or a full database, or an entire disk. But still, there's an inherent tension between security and efficiency. For security's sake, we'd like our plain text to be as long as possible to harvest all of its entropy. For efficiency's sake, we'd like to work on smaller, cipher, on smaller plain text and small cipher text. There's a way of, uh, uh, of resolving this tension, at least to some extent, uh, and it's called incrementality. Uh, if our scheme is incremental, then um, uh, updating a single bit, changing a single bit in the plain text uh, will only cause changes in the relatively few bits uh, in the ciphertext. And we'll call this uh, this um, degree uh, of, of uh, uh, this degree delta, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be uniform bound on the number of, of bits that change in the ciphertext when a single bit in the uh, in the input changes. And we can talk about different kinds of uh, update uh, operations that can be applied, applied to the plain text. If someone has access to the plain text or to the private key, we can talk about setting a bit, setting a bit either, either to zero or one. Or if our scheme is homomorphic, we can allow flipping a bit or kind of some linear operation on the bit. So I think it by now kind of uh, uh, the title of the talk that is incremental deterministic public encryption makes sense to you. This is what we are trying, we'll be trying to construct for the rest of the talk. Uh, our, uh, in, uh, uh, in short, our results uh, are the following. We'll give a low bound that bounds the incrementality bound uh, in terms of the size of the, pl size of the plain text, the assumption on the mean entropy of the plain text, and log of the length, uh, length of the cipher, cipher text. And this log, it's kind of interesting. If the cipher text is allowed to be exponentially long, then there, are, uh, there exist schemes with a constant, almost constant uh, locality. Second, 
we describe uh, two solutions, one generic that relies and converts arbitrary uh, 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 public key deterministic encryption scheme into incremental public key deterministic encryption. And a second solution, which I'll spend the, uh, the bulk of the talk on, is based on the uh, DDH assumption. And it's tight. Uh, uh, it's, it matches the low bound up to polylog factors. So uh, what if we are given uh, a deterministic uh, public encryption scheme that does not have incrementality? We want to encrypt possibly longer plain text uh, with incrementality property. A very kind of naive solution that is used all over the place is to uh, chop the, uh, the plain text in, into blocks and encrypt these, encrypt these blocks individually. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if the uh, original plain text, the long plain text, had some substantial mean entropy, we have, uh, we have no guarantees, guarantees about mean entropy of individual blocks. Uh, a useful and interesting uh, lemma that uh, will save the day here is called sample and extract. It was first proposed by Nissan Zuckerman in 1996, refined or strengthened by Salil Vadan in 2004. And what it states is that if the source has mean entropy, then projection of the source to a randomly selected subset of bits will preserve its mean entropy rate. That is, if, this, for example, the source had uh, uh, 10, was 10,000 bit long and had 5,000 bit, bits of mean entropy, if we take a random, sam random, random sample of 1,000 bits with very high probability, uh, this random subset of 1,000 bits will have at least 100 bits of, of mean entropy. So with uh, this lemma in mind, uh, it's uh, easy to see that uh, uh, if instead we divide the input into randomly chosen subsets and encrypt, like put the uh, bits in the subset together and encrypt them using the uh, scheme that, uh, whose, um, whose existence we assume, the resulting scheme is going to be a secure public key, the deterministic public encryption. The only catch is that it will require a somewhat stronger definition that should hold in respect to multiple messages that I didn't define. Uh, and we only uh, know how to construct deterministic public encryption scheme that is satisfy the stronger definition uh, in the random Oracle model. Uh, and yeah, I didn't uh, explain why the new scheme will have, uh, why the scheme that we construct will have incrementality, but I think it's easy to see. If a single bit is updated, if a white bit is updated in the plain text, then we only have to recompute the white uh, cipher text. OK, so in order to construct uh, uh, a deterministic encryption uh, public encryption scheme in the uh, standard model, uh, we'll have to do something different. We can't rely uh, on this generic construction because we don't know how to meet a stronger definition in the standard model. So in the rest of the talk, we'll be constructing uh, a deterministic public encryption scheme with incrementality based on the DDH assumption. And uh, we'll be heavily leaning, uh, we'll, our stepping stone is going to be the concept of lossy trapdoor functions that we covered uh, extensively in the morning section, uh, session yesterday. Uh, and I'll recap the definition of lossy trapdoor functions here quickly. So they were introduced by Packard Waters uh, in 2008. And they, co they come in two modes. One is injective, where the function is invertible, given a trapdoor. And the lossy mode, where the function actually compresses, maps its domain to a shorter, uh, smaller range. And the security definition says that uh, descriptions of these two functions, it's their public keys, are, uh, ought to be computationally indistinguishable. So we um, uh, consider a different, a new primitive that we call smooth trapper functions that look roughly the same. Uh, it come, it, again, it has two modes, one injective, where the, when the function is invertible, another smooth, where we say that uh, the function evaluated on a source of mean entropy k has to uh, uh, induce a distribution which is statistically close to the distribution to the, to the uniform distribution on the ciphertext. So this is kind of our uh, new uh, 
uh, definition, which strictly speaking is incomparable with lossy treble functions, but in fact is slightly stronger. I'll, I'll show you in a second why. So I claim that smooth treble functions are sufficient for our definition of uh, deterministic public encryption. Why is that? Uh, in the objective mode, when we encrypt a message, uh, the, and the adversary gets to specify two sources of, uh, of messages, each of which, uh, each of which is, has a mean address PK. We switch the injective mode uh, to the smooth mode without adversaries noticing because the adversary is computationally bounded. And now uh, this, um, uh, uh, these two distributions are both statistically close to the uniform distribution on the ciphertext. Uh, by the property of our smooth driver functions. Therefore, uh, the, uh, the original distributions, these two guys, are going to be computationally indistinguishable. To construct smooth driver functions out of lossy driver functions, you only have to, uh, you only have to comp compose these functions uh, with a pairwise independent, independent permutation. And actually, this construction was implicit uh, in uh, Boulder and others in crypto 2000, 2008. So if you do that, if you first apply a pairwise independent permutation, then a lossy treble function, by the ha leftover hash lemma, you'll end up with a smooth treble function. This is why I say that uh, smooth treble functions are somewhat a stronger primitive than lossy treble functions in that sense. And uh, uh, that was the way that Boulder and others constructed deterministic public encryption without actually defining, uh, like calling out this uh, smooth threader functions as a separate primitive. The catch is that uh, this construction is incompatible with our, with our goal of incrementality because uh, uh, pairwise independent permutations, by their definition, cannot be incremental. If you uh, change a bit, one bit in the input, it can potentially affect all bits of the output. This is by definition of the of uh, pairwise independent permutations. So we have to do something different. But still, our construction will be inspired by existing constructions by Freeman and others, and uh, more more, even more closely by Berkowski and Segev from last year's script. Uh, it will be inspired by construction uh, of lossy tribal functions based uh, under the DDH assumption. So we assume that we have a group of prime order p. Uh, to generate a key, we'll sample a matrix, a random matrix, uh, uh, a random n by n matrix, where n is the size of the plain text. And uh, the secret key is going to be the inverse of the matrix. The public key is going to be the generator of the group raised to the power of this matrix, which uh, uh, will just mean element-wise exponentiation. To encrypt, uh, you, uh, uh, you compute, you multiply the plain text on the left by the matrix, and you raise g to this power, and it's relatively easy to see that you can do it given the public key alone. To decrypt, uh, you uh, use the, uh, the inverse, uh, A inverse, which is the secret key, and to solve the disk log problem for bits, which is a very simple problem. And the security argument for lossy treble functions uh, hinges on, on the fact that, uh, uh, that these two distributions, one is G raised to random full, full rank uh, square matrices, and another G raised to random rank one matrices, these two distributions are computationally distinguishable. Uh, and the first family of matrices corresponds to the injective mode, the second family of matrices correspond to the smooth mode, uh, sorry, to the lossy mode, where we compress a uh, n-bit input to a single group element. Uh, when uh, we, uh, for our goal of constructing incremental smooth driver functions, we'll want these matrices to be sparse. This will guarantee incrementality. And uh, our second goal is gonna be uh, uh, somewhat different. Uh, we'll be happy with uh, uh, compressing the input to just L group elements. Mm. Uh, uh, and 
the condition that we want to satisfy is that if the plain text uh, has a mean entropy key, then uh, the, under the second family of matrices, uh, this, um, uh, the result is going to be statistically close to, to the uniform distribution over a hyperplane of uh, dimension L. Uh, how do we do that? Achieving the second property is actually easy. Uh, if we take, uh, again, we will be want, we'll want to construct sparse matrices. So we'll construct this skinny n by L matrix. Each uh, of its row will have just a fixed number of uh, small number of random elements. And uh, multiplying this matrix uh, uh, by, by a vector will result in L uh, uh, group elements. And uh, it's uh, easy to verify that a combination of the sample and extract and left over hash lemma, or a variant of the left of the left over hash lemma, guarantee that the resulting distribution is going to be uniform over L uh, group elements. Why is that? Because the sample, if we multiply, uh, if we multiply this vector by this matrix, uh, then the each of the rows will select a random subset of these bits. So uh, by the sample and extract lemma it will mean that it will say that the resulting subset will have some mean entropy. And then uh, uh, a, a scalar product of, um, of a random vector uh, is a strongly universal hash function, which by the left over hash lemma will guarantee uniformity of the, of the output. But uh, uh, this matrix, this uh, skinny matrix, cannot possibly be confused with the rank uh, with the n with the rank n matrix, it, because its rank is at most l. So what we'll do is that we'll take rows of this matrix and multiply them by random elements. Uh, it will kind of uh, will will make the matrix square, but it won't change the dimensionality of the output. It will still be uh, confined to this uh, to a hyperplane of dimension three. Uh, and uh, finally, it's, uh, on, on this example, it's, uh, this matrix, the resulting matrix, can still have some structural uh, zeros that form that prevent it from being full rank. So we'll just add by fiat uh, elements that will uh, all line up on the main diagonal. And now uh, we have these two family of matrices, one which I constructed as before. Another is obtained by replacing all non-zero elements on the left with random elements. So this, uh, the matrix on the right, uh, with overwhelming probability, will be a full rank because its, uh, its main diagonal is uh, all is non-zeros. And uh, under the, uh, the DDH assumption, uh, G raised to the matrix on the left versus G raised to the matrix on the right, these two distributions are going to be computationally indistinguishable. Incrementality follows by construction. We made sure that the matrix is sparse. Uh, if we update a single bit uh, in the plain text, uh, then only the bits touched by, uh, by non-zero elements that sit in a single row will be, will be updated. Uh, so sparseness of the matrix will directly translate into incrementality of our scheme. So uh, that uh, concludes, uh, I'll conclude the talk with uh, open problems. Uh, so meeting a, uh, a stronger security definition, so the definition that uh, we met is good for a single, for a single message, it's good for blo block sources, uh, but there is a stronger definition that uh, uh, we don't know how to achieve under, uh, with the goal of incre incrementality. Uh, we also, it also would be interesting to construct length-preserving incremental deterministic public encryption in the standard model. And there's a general question about deterministic encryption uh, to relax the definition to allow some dependency of the public key on the, uh, on the sources and still kind of give some meaningful security guarantees. Uh, so I call out this as an interesting problem in the area of deterministic public encryption. And with this, I conclude. We have uh, time for a couple of questions. Question, question. 
Thank you. Um, so I, I know you've already said you, you haven't met all the, met the strongest security model you'd like to, but I'm, I'm quite troubled by the security model you do, you do use. So you're asking an adversary to distinguish between two sources, fair enough, but then you say those two sources will both have a certain minimum entropy. Now, what, why is, when is that a safe assumption to make? Why would it be safe? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, it, uh, 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 I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, so the, the uh, examples that we have, have in mind are the following. Uh, there is an input, part of which the adversary control, and we don't really know, want to specify some specific control that the adversary has over the, the plain text. It can control some, some specific bytes of it, can, uh, can inject some dependency between bits of the input. But still, uh, the adversary doesn't know the entire plain text. Uh, it, there's some missing parts uh, 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 that will provide the required mean entropy. Uh, and uh, in the spirit of uh, symmetric security, we'll kind of uh, give the adversary almost arbitrary control over the, uh, uh, the plain text, uh, subject to this minimal requirement of, of mean entropy. I'm not sure if it answers your question, but uh, I think it's a relatively reasonable definition uh, that um, uh, subject, uh, so you have to buy into this condition, into this uh, notion that the public is independent of the source, but after you make the step, I think the rest uh, follows relatively, uh, is, is fairly natural. Ilya, I have a question. Ah, Adi. Uh. I'm concerned about uh, the following uh, bad interaction between uh, uh, the various notions. So suppose uh, you have a high entropy source, you have a database, you encrypted it. By looking at the original ciphertext and the ciphertext obtained after you made some changes, in your scheme, it's quite easy to get an estimate of how many bits changed. Uh, so even though you will not know the plain text, uh, you leaked information about the evolution of the database. So isn't it a problem in security definitions? That's correct, yes. Uh, so uh, uh, for the purpose of this talk, we wanted to separate the uh, security under incrementality versus security under, uh, sorry, security under updates versus security of the underlying scheme. So think of it as a, as a single shot game. First, uh, you, uh, sorry, an adversary has a single shot. So uh, you uh, uh, update your ciphertext as many times as you want. You want to have efficiency here. At some point, the adversary intervenes and, inter and uh, inter intercepts the ciphertext. And then the adversary has to determine which of the two sources uh, you interacted with. So the adversary doesn't get to see the updates. Uh, but it's obviously, a you, assumption. Yeah, you can consider, and uh, the stronger definition allows you, str the stronger multiple message definition allows the adversary uh, to specify changes between the, cipher the, between the plain text. Any, uh, any other questions? Good. Let's uh, thank Ilya again. And, uh